I want to start off tonight by saying I want to thank God for the opportunity to stand here and and to to convey what I feel that he has showed me in his word and I want to thank my pastor brother brother Julian for giving me this opportunity and helping me to to grow in in, in Christ and uh, I want I know that God has brought me to this moment in my life and I'm so thankful that he that he has made me who I am because all that I am and all that I ever will be I was listening to a song on the way to church and and now the title just totally slipped my mind but you know it it was uh what was the name of that song that I played over a couple of times but anyway it was it was talking about that we how we could trust God and how that we could if we would just let him speak through us and and let him do his will in our lives that that everything was going to be okay and it was just like a confirmation that you know I've been nervous and that everything is going to be okay because it's in God's hands and and he knows what he's doing he knows the the song said that he knows the beginning and the end and so that's it he knows he knows and he and that's it he does know he knows everything that that I'm going to do he knows uh everything that brother McManus is going to do and uh I pray that uh that he would be with me and that I could speak as he would have me to speak <clears throat> okay let's open our bibles to James chapter 1 beginning at verse 19 when you have it say amen Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart every filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Be ye doers of the word, not, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way. Straightway forgetteth the manner of man that he was. But whoso looketh into a perf the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein he being not forgetful a not forgetful hearer but a doer of the work this man shall be blessed in his deed if any man among you see, seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart this man religious religion is in vain pure religion and un and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So before I start, I, I want to say it. I want us to have a word of prayer that God will help me and speak through me the way that he would wish to speak through me and that his anointing would be on me and that I can convey his word to us tonight. Lord Jesus, I come to you, Lord, and I ask that you would be with us, Lord, and that you would help me, Lord, that your word would be come loose out of my heart, O oh God, and that I have read and I have put into my heart, O oh God. I pray that you would loose it, Lord, that I can speak it unto your people, Lord. Lord, it's your will that's to be done here. It's nothing about me, God. I'm just a man. But God, you're, you're the one who sits on the throne, and it's your will and not ours, God, that needs to be done here tonight. So, Lord, I ask that you help me to speak as an oracle of the Lord, to speak as a man that is anointed of you, O Lord, and let your anointing rest upon me and Brother McManus tonight, Lord. Lord, that we may convey what you would have us to say. In Jesus' name I pray, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right. So, <clears throat> let's, let's, I want to break these scriptures down. I want to start with verse 19. And it, t it talks about being quick to hear and slow to speak 
Well, I believe that God has gave us two ears and one mouth so that we can do twice as much listening as we do speaking. And I, and I say this a lot to my children because it's true. I mean, I, I don't think it's a mistake that we have two ears and one mouth. Because <clears throat> when we're still and we're listening, He can give us direction. But also, when we're slow to wrath, to be slow to wrath, we can't let our emotions rule us. We need to have self-control, self-control, and that only comes by the righteousness of God because our righteousness is filthy. And that, that's verse, the verse 20, 19 and 20, by the way. And then we're going to move into 21. And this, this one here, I'm kind of a little bit, little bit more long-winded in this one here. But what I think this verse of Scripture is trying to tell us is that, that we need to set aside excessive sinfulness. And that we need the sinful nature and be submissive and ready to let God speak to you <clears throat> with His Word that He has planted in our hearts because it, it will not only change our life, but it will save our, our souls. Last Sunday, I was on the way to church and me and my daughter, Megan, and we, we both, we were, we, were, uh, we were praying together. We were, there was something that was, that was bothering us both and we needed guidance and we needed help from the Lord. So we, we joined hands together and we prayed and when we got to the church, you know, Megan was like, well, it's, I've got to speak today, and I, I don't know what to do. And, and, uh, and so, you know, the, the Lord had been blessing, with me, blessing me, and he started speaking, from, from, and it came from in here. And I, and I started giving Megan what she needed to hear, but only because that word was planted deep down inside of my soul. So that word, I was able to convey that word because I was listening to the, what the Spirit was saying to me. And so I gave her some scriptures, and lo and behold, on the way home, she, she told me. She said, you know, with those scriptures you gave me lined right up with what he was talking about. Because it said, the scripture was, was talking about that my sheep hear my voice. And, and so that was exactly what Brother Faulkner was talking about. So if I wouldn't have been listening to what God was trying to say, I couldn't have conveyed that to my daughter. Hmm. All right, let's go move on. Move on to verse twenty-two. Um, this is this is what I believe this says is that you must obey what the word of the Lord says and apply it to your life if not you're just fooling yourself into thinking that you're okay I don't want to just fool myself into thinking that I'm okay I want to do what God wants me to do and be obedient to the to the call of God in my life so I've got to I've got to just take the word inside of me and let it do what, what it's supposed to do. I'm supposed to let the word change me and mingle with my spirit so that, so that it can have an outward appearance. The fruit is what the word says, that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Those, those, that, that word is what we need to get in us, not to just, not to just think about it, but we got to let it become a part of us. And when we let it become a part of us, it changes us. And I'm living proof that the Word of God changes us. My life is an example of this. When I let this get inside of me, it changed me forever, and I've never been the same since. And I'm so glad that I have an opportunity to be changed. I, I'm so glad that He called my name. Because I, I, I could have died. I would, just like the pastor said the other night, when I was in the world, man, I did some things that I could have been shot and killed. I had people come up to me and put guns in my face. I, I, I shot up drugs. I did things that would have, would have killed 
other people, but you know what? God had His hand on me. And He's seen that there would be something different in my future. And I'm so glad tonight that there is, that there is something in my future. And I'm getting away from what I'm supposed to be talking about. And uh, let me get back here. So let me get to verse 23 and 24. Okay. course you've got to let it seep inside of you and, and and you've got to let it let it come out of you so how do you let it come out of you you got to be a doer of the word okay so uh verse 23 and 24 i answered these together so we, so you began to listen to god's word but you let the cares this is this is what i feel it's saying but you let the cares of this this life get in the way and all the distractions that that we all have a tendency to do and we forget all about what God uh, forget all about God and what he is trying to say to our lives through his word I, I believe that that's what verse 23 is trying to tell us so I want to be able to not forget about what he's trying to say to me I want to try to be able to take it and, and ponder it and apply it to my life and figure out how that I'm supposed to walk. Because if I, just, if I just forget about what God's trying to tell me, what good is that doing me? What good is that going to do any of us if we forget about what He wants to do for us? All right, so verse 25. But if we study, this is again, these are my words. If we study and search the Scriptures and ask God how to apply them, His Word to, to our lives, and, he, and really take it serious. I mean, just get, get, get serious about it. Then not only will God's Word change us, but it will also bring a blessing upon us. So here I am, 20 years later. God has blessed me. When I, came to, when I married my wife, I had a bag of clothes and a pool behind trailer that she bought me. I was on the run from the Mexican Mafia. My life was a shambles. I had nowhere else to go. And I was facing 30 years in prison. So you tell me, you tell me if, if you don't, if you listen to what God has to say, that he won't pour out his blessings upon you. Because here I am today, I've owned two businesses. I should have never been where I am today. And God is prospering me beyond what I deserve. I have never been this busy in all my, all my life. I one job after another after another and they just keep coming. And I know that that's God because only good things come from God. And the enemy would try to discourage us and try to tell us that oh, you're not good enough and you're you're not you're not worthy. But you know what? None of us are. But but you know what? God made us worthy through his righteousness and I'm thankful for that tonight. Okay. So so what I think about verse 26 is that, that the Scripture is trying to say uh, that if you don't have control over your tongue, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with your walk. And you need to get, get on your knees and pray back through. Because you're not really a Christian. If you can't control what's... The Bible says what's in the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if, it's, if there's something in your heart where you're spitting out profanities, man, that's not what God wants. That's not, that's not godly. So you've got you've to search yourself and look at yourself and, and be able to, to figure out what it is that's causing this in your life and then get back on your knees right here at the altar and, and ask God to forgive you for it. And he will. He's just. All right, I know I'm, I'm not pretty quick here, but uh, verse 27. We need to care for those in this world who are less fortunate than us. And, then that are, and not let the cares of this life and the ways of this world rub off on us and change us and make us into something that God has not made us to be. We don't want... We don't want we want to be in the world, of course, the Bible says, but we don't want to be a part of this world. 
We've got to help those that are in need, the homeless, like like uh, Sister uh, Tommy is doing. And, and uh, Sister, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Anyway, Sister Stacy. Um, and and uh, that's a great thing uh, because we need to give back. We need to give back what God's given us. And that's, that's what God wants every one of us to do. He wants us to, to be ambassadors. And if we can represent what he wants us to be and, and his spirit, we show that his love through us because that's, that's the whole thing is we need to be full of his love. Because when we can convey that to those that are homeless, those that are left, less fortunate, the drug addicts, those that are, that are sick and dying in the hospital, or, or those that, that, that need a touch from God just in their everyday life, that we could just be an ambassador to that. I believe that God will, will honor that, and we'll see a revival like we've never seen. And, uh, but definitely do not let the cares of this life rub off on you. Do not let the bills, when the bills come in, there, that's another song I was listening to, and it was talking about uh, my, all my bills got paid when I called on Jesus' name. You know what? That's true. So if we don't, don't let those things in the world, the TV, because we can watch, I, I'm guilty. I've been guilty of watching things and letting things get inside of my, my, my mind that shouldn't be there. And, and uh, listening, it, it, music especially, if whatever we listen to, all those things can rub off on us, and they can cause us to, to fall short and cause us not to do what God's will is for our life. So we've got to get on track. That's all I have. Thank you, Brother Hoskins, very much. Um, we live in an hour. The Word of God is so greatly needed. There's not one of us that is void of the responsibility of passionately pursuing our relationship with Jesus Christ. Not one of us uh, here tonight gets uh, an excuse or a pass. It's like, Brother Hetty, I, you know, I've got a pass, you know. I, I don't really have to know who he is because the Bible is very clear about many things. Uh, but Jesus even said in his own words, there's going to be many that will come in that day that will have a revelation of the name of Jesus. And they will not know me. He said there's going to be many that will come they will cast out devils. They will do mighty miracles. They will show signs and wonders. Um, they'll do a lot of things in the name. They'll have a revelation of the name. And they will see things happen because they use the authority of the name. How many are glad tonight to know that there is authority in the name of Jesus Christ? However, he says that I will say to them, depart from me. You worker of iniquity. Now think about that. Think about it. You're, you're doing what you thought was the work of God, the ministry of God. You're, you're seeing signs and wonders. Many people would say, well, there you go. God confirmed I am approved of God. But Jesus said, I will say to you, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. And that word know is to, to have a relationship with. I never, I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. In other words, you kind of uh, didn't have really the authority to use my name. You used my name. You were an ambassador for me, but I never knew you. It's kind of like a fraudulent use there. It's kind of like someone getting a hold of your Social Security card, and they go out and they open up accounts, and, and they start getting all types of things. I, hopefully none of you have ever had that happen to you. Uh, I have couple times uh, couple, several years ago it's it's unfortunate it seems like it always happened to me when I was out of town when I was away from my home I'd go to use my debit card and all of a sudden uh, this this got rejected well, it, it's not rejected I I promise you there's there's money in there and uh, well that's not do you have another card no that's what I have 
and you go and you begin to do some investigation, someone has fraudulently used my car. They've used my name, Robert McManus, to purchase things, and they got them. They got them. But they got them fraudulently. And so what I'm trying to say is you have to be careful not to be a fraud when it comes to your relationship with Jesus Christ. Just because you um, experience the overflow of his presence on Sunday, but if you don't talk to him on Monday or Tuesday, you skip Wednesday, and you don't talk to him on Thursday or Friday or Saturday, there's something wrong. And so you, you, might, you might just really don't want me to say those things, but this is a serious deal. Your salvation depends upon it. Can I just be that plain tonight? Can I just say it that way? Your salvation depends upon your relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you can fake it, if you can put on and put on a facade and, and really are able to, to pull the wool over everybody's eyes, I'm telling you, you are going to have to give an account one day. You will really give an account. And it takes work. It takes work, just like every relationship we have. It takes work. It doesn't accidentally happen. You don't accidentally have conversations. You have to take time. You don't accidentally go out on a date or, or an opportunity, just, just a time to discuss and talk about things. It has to happen. There's an uh, intentionality that comes into play. And so is our relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's so important. That's the reason why I have no clue. I don't have this in my notes, but someone needs to hear this. This is what this is talking about. It's talking about the reality of our true relationship with Jesus Christ matters. And you can fake it all you want, but God knows where you are. He knows if you're talking to him on Monday. He knows whether you're talking to him on Tuesday. You can skip it all you want. You can try to believe that it's something like uh, some people believe, like a car, you know. You put $5 in, that didn't fill your tank up. You could try to go on a, a vacation trip, just put $5, put $10. I never understood that, that concept. Some people do that. They'll put $5 in. Now, I'm not going to ask you tonight if you just put $5 in when you go to the gas station or put $10 in. I've always been one. If I make it to the gas station, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the fuel in the tank because I don't know. I may need a little bit more than what I thought. I might get caught up in traffic. And I don't want to be broke down on the side of the road, Sister Ambrosia. So we, we have to realize that the, the same is true in our, our walk with Jesus Christ. Don't, don't $5 it when you come to church. Oh, that did me in right there. That, that filled my tank. Did it? Seriously? That Build your tank. What kind of candy land are you going through? You're not going through the real roads of life because life sometimes can be long. Sometimes there are difficult days. Sometimes we get stuck in places that we didn't intend to, and we got to make it back to the house of God. That's why we got to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's extremely important. Now, let me skip around here. I know, I know that uh, this is, just, just listen to the verses. I'm not asking you to dissect these, these verses and, and try to make a continuity here. I'm going to make that for you. And so when you see me skip around, you're going to say, well, why didn't you just keep going? There's a purpose, because I do have one specific task tonight the Lord has asked me to present to you. Uh, but before, I, I, wanna be, I want to be... Um, True to the, the whole context in the passage. We're looking at verses 1 through uh, 18. But I, I want to start with verse 17. Knowing this, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good gift, every perk perfect gift is from above it comes from our father now here's the thing what you call a good gift and what god calls a good gift sometimes is different what you would call a good gift would mean the easiest road would mean uh comfort would mean 
uh, you're in control. Uh, would also mean that you, you know all of the steps that you're going to be required to go on. That's, to us, that's what we want. We want to know. We want to be in control. We want to tell God he's got to do it this way, and when he doesn't, we're upset with him. That's, that's our good gift. But when God uh, presents a good gift, it's packaged a little differently. Sometimes you really can miss the great gifts from God looking at the circumstances of your life, looking at how it's delivered. You may not like the delivery man sometimes. But when you unwrap the gift, when you discover what's been fully delivered, then hopefully there's something of joy there. And that's exactly what happens when we look at what God delivers to us. Sometimes it arrives and we do not like how it's being delivered. Before we even know its purpose, before we even know what he's really delivered to us, we do not like the process. We don't even know the product, the end result, but we do not like the process. Let me tell you that every good gift, everything that comes, let me say it another way, everything that God gives to you is for your good. He will bring it out for your good, even the things he allows to come into your life. How many know tonight that God doesn't, doesn't make everything that comes into your life? He doesn't, he doesn't control it like that. Like, he didn't come in your, into your, your life and, and all of a sudden you wake up one day and your, your engine is blown. God didn't go out that night, not normally. Now, sometimes he might, but not normally. He didn't, he didn't cause that engine to, to, to uh, blow a piston or whatever it is. Maybe, maybe, like life is, really is, a lot of times about choices. Maybe the fact that you went 12,000 miles over your, your oil change time. Maybe you disregarding that oil change light, and that was 12,000 miles ago, and it didn't have any oil. Maybe, just possibly, it's your own fault that your engine blew up. According to Scripture, sometimes it's just our own fault. Things come our way. If we're really honest, we like to blame God. It's much easier to do that. But God will allow us to make bad decisions even. God will allow us to make bad decisions. Now, that goes a lot of different reasons, and we don't have enough time to go over that. He will allow that to happen so that our dependency will increase, so that his glory is revealed, that he can ultimately do his perfect plan. But here's, here's the scriptures. We look at this, verse, uh, verse 2. We'll do two and four, consider it holy joyfully. I'm going to read out the uh, Amplified Version. You can read along in King James, whatever you want. The New Living Translation, NIV, uh, that's fine. Whatever you would like. Young's Literal Translation, ESV, whatever your specialty is, okay? But I'm going to read out the Amplified Version. Uh, consider it hopefully joyful, my brethren, whenever you are enveloped in or encounter trials of any sort. Or fall into various temptations. How many would like that scripture to be removed from the Bible? I mean, isn't that a challenging scripture? You're supposed to be joyful. You're supposed to be like, that's your worship for the moment. You're supposed to worship God. God, I thank you so. Oh, Lord, I, I've got to get beside myself right now. You've allowed this great difficulty in my life. You've allowed this great trial of my life. Try to apply that one to your life. Try to put that one into practice. All right? Be assured and understand that the trial and proving of your faith bring out endurance and steadfastness and patience. Or as the King James says, uh, that knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh, worketh patience. That's why you got to be careful not to pray for patience because there's something that brings about uh, patience. Um, you might not want to pray, again, how God delivers it and God how it brings it about. We don't want that. We don't want that good gift. How many know if you had more patience, it'd be a good thing? Anybody want to deny that? It'd be a good thing if we had a little bit more patience. I know it would be for me. It'd be great. But you know what? In order to have that, you've got to go through some things. You need a trying of your, of your faith. Uh, but let endurance and steadfastness and patience have full Play and do a thorough work so that you may be a people perfectly and fully developed with no, no defects, lacking in 
nothing. In other words, this is part of the good gift God's giving to you. He's calling you to a difficult place, but it's still his gift. Now, but I don't see it, it, but it hasn't been unpackaged yet. He hasn't fully developed it or, or unfolded it to you, but it is a good gift. Now, if I skip down to verse 12, blessed, happy to be envied is the man who is patient under trial and stand under temptation for when he has stood the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted from God, for God is incapable of being tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. So in other words, again, these things have purpose. God allows things to come our way, so it accomplishes his purpose, not yours. We all would love a diet that requires no effort. Now, some of you don't need a diet, so you just stay there with your old healthy, bad self. But some of us uh, need uh, help, we, myself especially. And I've, I've journeyed on, uh, I'm on 10 days already. I'm, I'm trying to make these huge shifts of my diet and my plan and my exercise every day. And I've got uh, a good amount of time ahead of me. But, but I want to tell you, you have to be very intentional when it concerning if I want to be in health, I've got to eat the right things. I've got to do the right things. I've got to, I've got to plan my life a little bit better. It, it's not going to accidentally ha- happen. You're not, going to, you're not going to do a meal planning in the spur of the moment. You, if you're to really do it healthy, uh, you, you probably should be eating every two to three uh, hours in small quantities. That ain't going to happen by accident. You're not going to, you're all of a sudden, oh, wow, look, it's, uh, it's time for me to eat again. Uh, where's that healthy thing that I need to snack on? You won't find it. You didn't even go buy it, so there you go. But there is some Doritos, and, and there's some Crunch and Munch, and there's some Pecan Sandies, and there's some Bluebell ice cream that just recently got back on shelves. You know, there's all those things. Well, you know, that's got nutritional value. That's what we try to tell ourselves. You have to be very intentional when you're looking at, uh, you got to take it serious. So when you look at, uh, your trials of your faith when you following God is very intentional. When we look at the next couple of verses, again, I've got to speed up because there's something I really, really need to share with you tonight. But every man or every person is tempted when he's drawn away, enticed and baited by his own evil desire, his, past, uh, his passion, his lust then the evil desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it's fully matured brings forth death then he says this word do do not be misled my beloved brethren let me just say verse 16 let me just tell you what that means he's saying don't be confused that's not god that's not god doing that if you're tempted and you're going to sin god didn't do that in your life No, he's calling it out. He said, don't don't be confused here. There's a difference between the trial of our faith and the things that we will endure, the afflictions, the difficulties of life, the things that will come our way that God will either allow or it just happens. And, well, he spells it out. We just read it. There's, well, know this, there's three types of lust the Bible records. There's the lust of, of men. There's the lust of Satan. And there's the lust or the desires of God. Same word, desires, lust, however you want to say it. When you look at it from the biblical standpoint, it's the same, the desires. There's three different categories. The seven steps in temptation are these, and I'm just trying to summarize so I can focus tonight. And I've got a lot of scriptures, but I will not be able to get them all, and that's okay, because I have something very serious that I'd like to present to you. And it will be encouraging, by the way. When you look at the seven steps in the temptation, first, you're tempted. You begin to have a thought of evil. Number two, you're drawn away. You began to have a strong imagination. That's why the Bible talks about that we are to cast down every imagination, everything that exalts itself against, you know, the things of God, against Jesus Christ. We, We have to be very active in that. We can't allow our imagination to go rampant. Do you know... Do you know that that faith and fear take the same amount of energy? 
Do you know this is like, it's scientifically proven? If you need resources, I can direct you. There's great Christians that have proven this. That you have to do the same exact thing. When you go beyond where you are right now and you begin to worry about things, you go outside of the present, you begin to articulate and envision, you begin to put all of these scenarios in your mind that may never happen, by the way, but in your mind, you're just, you're formulating these, you're creating these, you're, and all of a sudden, it, it comes to pass. Faith is the same way. There's no more evidence in the physical realm. There's no more reason to, uh, to have, you know, fear or to have worry than there is to have faith. There is, it's the same logical uh, reason. It's just you get to choose which one you want to apply to your life. And I'll speak more of that in just a moment. So after there's the drawing away, the strong imagination, verse uh, number three is the lust. It's the delight in viewing. It's, it's that moment, that transition, you go from thinking about it to all of a sudden there's a certain pleasure, whatever that may be. It might even be pain to you, but all of a sudden there's a reason why you want to attach to it whether it's you, you feel a necessity to, to, to kind of uh, want to fight against it, you want to you react to it, whatever it may be, there's all, all of a sudden there's an acceptance that takes place. And then, number four, you're enticed. There's the weakening of the will. Your, your will is now weakened. You've been thinking about it, now there's pleasure, now your will is weakened. Oh, I've been thinking about that Bluebell ice cream. I'm going down the aisle I'm so hungry, I haven't ate all day. I haven't been intentional on my diet. You know, I should go down that other aisle, but i got to go down this one. And all of a sudden, it must be God. There's the bluebell ice cream. It's God's will. It's right there. I mean, God surely wouldn't have put it before me. And you know how hungry I am. And you know I need it at this moment. If I don't eat this bluebell ice cream, see, you begin to rationalize it. You've never done that, of course, but it can happen. Number five, lust conceived. You begin to yield to it. Number six, you sin. The act is committed. The sinful act is committed. And then seven, death. It's the result of the actual sin. That's the seven, seven steps in temptation. Okay? So, we're, to summarize, we're not to be confused. When these things were drawn away by our own desires and our own wishes, that's not to be confused with the desires that God wants you to have. You're supposed to be led by God. The Bible is very clear. Uh, in fact, let me uh, read here, if I can. I've read this before, probably, uh, before you. I know I've read it many times in my own personal study. I've read it, who knows, hundreds of times, if not thousands of times. I have, I have processed this uh, particular verse. So it's not like something I'm giving to you. I've never, wow, I've never thought about that. Uh, Romans 8, 6. For the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit, is death. Again, this is amplified. Death that comprises of all the miseries arising from sin, both here and hereafter. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul peace, both now and forever. In other words, you have a choice every day. Well, I've served God for 20 years. Okay, that's great. That's wonderful. But you're going to realize to be like Paul, to put everything behind you, count it as lost. You've not crossed the finish line. You've got to continue pressing towards the mark of the high calling, the prize that's set before us. You've got to keep pressing. And you might have felt miserably yesterday or today. You have made major mistakes. You've got to put that behind you. None of that matters now. None of it, good or bad. Do you know, not know that that was the sin, part of the sin in the, bio, in the first sin in the Bible? The disobedience of God's word, of course. But they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Not just evil. It was the knowledge of good. What is good? See, we all struggle with, oh, I think that's good. We want to be enticed by our own flesh. What we think is right. Be careful. Be careful, don't have enough time to talk about it, but be careful when you begin to say, well, I don't feel that way. What does the Word of God say about it? Be careful. Well, I don't see it that way. Be careful. 
Because it's not about what you see. God is a, he's a sovereign judge. He is a great God. He's an amazing God. There's no point in your life that he is ever in darkness. I love, I find comfort in that. I find great comfort in that, that he is light. The Bible is very clear. When you read the end book in Revelations, that, that God alone is the light. There's no, no more need for the sun or the moon. God is light. And it goes on to tell us who God is in his fullness because it says the lamb is the light. The lamb is the one that sits upon the, the throne, one throne. How many know tonight who that lamb is? That, that is, you know, Jesus Christ. John said, behold, the lamb of God. Only God can be the root and the offspring. Only God can be the sacrifice and the high priest that accepts it. Only God can be those things. And we could go on and on. So we understand that we have to choose each and every day. Will I choose Will I choose life, which is the mind of the spirit, or will I choose death? Now, here's an easy way, real easy way, and i got to go on and finish up here. You can figure out if you're operating in the mind of the spirit or mind of the flesh. Real easy, real easy. It's, it says it in Scripture. Mind of the flesh is death. So if, you're, if you realize and begin to realize that your joy is being depleted, if it's dying, if your peace is dying, you're not feeling, because you know peace really comes from the Lord, according to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures, real joy comes from the Lord. It is, it is the joy of the Lord that is our, our strength. When you begin to notice the things of God no longer around, you might want to take, take a spiritual check. Say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what am I thinking here? Because I know in my personal life, the moment if my mind begins to operate in the, the mind of the flesh, all of a sudden, I don't have the peace that I had. But the moment I say, you know what, wait a minute, God, I'm sorry. i got to cast down every imagination. i got to pull down everything that exalts itself above God, above, above Christ that sits on the throne. In other words, even my worries and my fears cannot be exalted above Jesus Christ. There's only one that can sit on the throne. And I choose not to allow anything else to be my God. There's only one God. There's only one Savior. And He is Jesus Christ. And I make a decision to live my life in the mind of the Spirit, not in the mind of the flesh. And we do have a choice. Don't tell me you don't have a choice. That contradicts the Word of God. You have a choice every day you live. Well, I had a bad day yesterday, but today's a different day. I've had a bad day today, but right now is a different moment. You can choose. I'm telling you. I've applied it to my life. You get in your prayer closet, and I might be going down the road. That might be like i got to take a bathroom break. All of a sudden, you're getting a hold of God travailing. Wherever that may be, whatever you got to do, it's that important. you got to get your mind in the, in the mind of the Spirit. It is that important because life, when you have the mind of the Spirit, all of a sudden you have peace, you have joy, you have the things of God. And it is important because if you're going to live when He returns, You've got to have the mind of the Spirit. You have to have the mind of the Spirit. Now here is something I want to leave with you tonight. And this is what uh, I feel strongly as I ask God, okay, what, what would be the most important thing? And here it is. I want you to notice Verse 5, starting with verse 5. If any of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask. Of the giving God who gives to everyone liberally, ungrudgingly, without reproaching or fault finding, and it will be given him. So in other words, there's no excuse. If you don't have wisdom to deal with the situations in your life, the trials in your life, the affliction in your life, ask God how to deal with it. Ask God what you're supposed to do. Ask God why he allowed it to come into your life. And then once you know why he allowed it to come in your life, to say that it, he didn't allow it is to say that God's not sovereign because he knows all things. He sees all things happening, even though he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily is the one that, that brings them to pass. He allows things to come into our lives. Why did you allow it? And then once you understand why he allowed it, you've got to ask, what is the purpose? So that it can be lived out in my life. I know that sounds like the same, but there's a difference. Because you've got to begin to pray and ask, what is the perfect will of God for my life? I've got to know, God. I don't want just things come my way. Do you want to go through hardships just to have a hard time? Or do you want to be a better person? Not just a better person. I'm talking about take on the person 
of Jesus Christ. In other words, when people start to see you, they're like, this is insane. Because in your life, you're going through difficulty, but I see a peace that passes understanding. Like, it doesn't make sense why you got peace. How do you have peace in the middle of your trial? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord is the one that gives me strength. The Lord is the one that I place my trust in. I don't place my trust in the things of this world, in the system of this world. I don't place my trust in my flesh. I don't look at the things he challenges with me in my own spirit where he's trying to lead me. You can look at that and say, oh, no, that ain't going to happen. No way. You can really shut down God and God saying, what are you doing? It's all about me. Ask God. That's what he's saying. Ask God and he will give it to you without reservation. This is not just, just a Mormon passage where Joseph Smith is praying this James 1, 5, and then he sees a vision of, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit sees a trinity, which is not according to Scripture. That alone should tell you they're not in the true book. It's not, this is not just a candy stick Scripture for, for LDS. This is, this is the Word of God. This is one you should be applying to your life, saying, God, give me wisdom. Give me understanding. The Bible tells us that the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's what the Bible says. So as we look at verse 6, Only it must be in faith. I want you to notice this. This is the core of everything. If you ask of God, it has to be in faith. It has to be in faith. And there's a reason. I'm going to show you here in just a second. I promise you, I I know very well how to wrap this up. Just just keep connected with me because you don't want to miss this. I've never seen this before. And maybe you have. And I'd love for you to share more than than what I've discovered. I just want to share this. I feel that God wants me to share this with you. It must be in uh, faith if he asks, uh, that he asks with no wavering. In other words, no hesitating, no doubting. For one who wavers, hesitates, or doubts is like a billowing surge out of the sea that is blown hither and thither and tossed by the wind. For truly, let no such person imagine that he will receive anything he asks from the Lord. For being as he is a man of two minds, or a double-minded man, hesitating, dubious. He is unstable and unreliable and uncertain about everything he thinks, feels, or decides. Did you catch that? That this is very important to your whole life. This is important for your family. This is important to your salvation. That when you ask God, you got to know who your father is. The Bible is real clear. There can't be fear. The Bible tells us that when, when love is perfected and fully mature in life, that it literally cast out all fear. It cast it out the door. Won't allow it to reside any longer. That when love is, and the love is the love knowing of our Father. When we understand the love of our Father, there is no more room for fear. There cannot be room for fear. In fact, Paul said later on that God does not give us the spirit of fear. No, 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 no. There, there's a sound mindness. There, there is strength. There's power that he's given to us. The spirit that, he, that he's given to us is not the spirit of a coward. We have to have faith. And why? It's important. We can't be like a two-minded. What kind of mind is he talking about? A double-minded. I always thought, well, that means you've got to have a little more faith than you have fear. That's what I always thought. It's not meaning that. It's meaning literally what the Bible talks about throughout the entire New Testament. Mind of the flesh mind of the spirit you see it throughout if you look at it in that terms and study it you will see that is a theme through the entire new testament you're either going to choose to walk by the flesh or you're going to walk by the spirit it's up to you it's in your mind and it's talking about a man that's wrestling with the flesh what you see and feel without the holy spirit giving you direction and one that's seeing the things that God is speaking in your life, asking you to, to pursue those and to walk by them. So in other words, we have, it's extremely important. I cannot tell you uh, with enough urgency tonight to walk your life with faith. I've got many things I would love to share with you. And, and here, here's a thought. Why don't you look up later on in Job 3.25 when Job is so... He's exhausted of all of his strength, and he says, the very thing that I have feared. 
the very dreadful thing that I've always worried about is now come upon me. Won't you study that and find out what that was? I'll give you a clue. It's found in uh, chapter 1, verse 5. Read it in a couple translations and you'll find out exactly what he fears. See, you got to be careful because fear and faith are almost identical in a lot of ways. I'm not talking about the power of positive thinking. I'm not talking about a metaphysical type religion or philosophy. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about that. But God has created us with a very intelligent mind. And you can either use it for his glory or not. You can either operate it by your sight. The Bible says we do not walk by sight. We walk by faith. That's what the Bible tells us. Here's the reason why it's important. We know the scriptures when we read, and you can read this later in Revelation chapter 10, read um, verses 9 and, t- uh, 9 and 10. We understand that the devil is cast down, and we see that salvation has come. It's come. There's a rejoicing in heaven, but they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and also they weren't conformed to this world. We know that rejoicing, but can I direct you an end tonight? And again, this is so important. I cannot... I cannot put enough emphasis on it. I'd like to direct your attention uh, to uh, Revelation chapter uh, 21. Mine's going blank, so I just have to use my memory. Revelation chapter 21. What you see, I want to draw the picture here so you can see this in, in context. When you look here, You see that God is is with men. The tabernacle of the Lord is there. This is verse 3. He's with his people. God shall personally be with them and be their God. Verse 4. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be anguish, nor grief, nor pain anymore. For the old conditions and the former order of things have passed away. He who is seated on the throne shall shall, shall say, See, I make all things new. And he said, record this, for these sayings are faithful. They are true. And he further said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning of the end. To the thirsty, I myself will give water without price from the fountain springs of water of life. He who is victorious shall inherit all these things, and I will be God to him, and he shall be my son. I want to to show you something in verse 8. I want to tell you, I want to first say it how we quote it. And then I want to read just just two things out of it, and I'm done. I want to quote this how we read this passage, at least from your memory and at least how I've always heard it. But all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's how we read it. That's how we quote it. Do you realize that that's not what that scripture, all it says? You ought to look at what it says. Now, before we read it, before we read it, just listen to this. The Bible is very specific in how it does things, especially in order. It's extremely important. I can go through when Jesus said, what is it, in Revelation 1.8, he said, I am the one which is, which was, and is to come. He didn't say the one which was and is and is to come. He didn't say past, present, future. No, he started with, I am the one which is. I am the one present. I am that I am. I is who I is, another way of saying it. He started with, I am the one which is. Order is everything. We would have said, oh, we got to be grammatically correct. We got to say, I am the one which was and and is and is to come. No, he didn't do that. He started the present. Why? Because that's how God operates. He always operates who he is right now in your life, not who he was always. We got to look to who he was, but we got to realize he's God right now. That's how you start, okay? So order is extremely important. There's a lot here. I could, I could uh, run down the details, but understand this. It's not accidental. A lot of times in Scripture, when it reads a list, it tells you the, the, the highest important ones, and it goes down the list. I want you to notice the first two, and I'm going to read it out of the King James. It doesn't skip to all liars shall have that part in hell. I want you to read this. But the fearful and unbelieving. But the fearful and the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake of fire. Do you want to know how important it is for us to get a hold of this when we pray and when we serve God and when we live this out in our life? 
It's extremely important, Sister Reckon. We have got to live by faith. We have got to trust God. We, there is no option here. Do you realize as a child of God, I know there can be children, but do you realize that not all children are obedient? There is what's called a rebellious child. And on that day, the Bible is very clear that he's going to sort through that. Not everybody is a sheep, Brother Shannon. The Bible says that he's going to put the goats on the left hand and the sheep on the right hand. It's extremely important that we have to be a believing people. We've got to be a trusting people that when we pray, we're not wavering. We're not trying to pray with the mind of our flesh, our, our senses, our reason, our intellect, our logic. We can't pray that way. We cannot be double-minded, two-minded. The, the Greek is literally two-souled. You're trying to be two people at the same time. You can't do it. You're going to either love one and hate the other. That's what the Bible tells us. It's extremely important. And that's it. Let's, let's end in prayer. Father, I pray. I, I feel your spirit so strongly here tonight. And I know your word is forever settled and, and it's so applicable to our life. And God, you know what we need to hear. And I thank you so greatly for allowing us to, to talk about your word and to, to really get into the, the scriptures because they are life. And they are a hope. And this is what we draw our strength from, God. We don't rely upon our, our feelings and our, just our emotions to be, to be stirred. God, we really want the word of God to be lived out in our lives. Go with us tonight. Let your blessing be upon your people. Let us really be bold in our prayers and have faith like we never have before. And if anyone is wavering in their faith tonight, God, I'm asking to give them a special strength, Lord. I'm asking you to give somebody tonight a boldness that maybe they've never had before in their prayers to stop worrying about what this is that's so big and, and they can't understand it, they can't process it. They're trying to approach it in their, their, their mind or their flesh. They're trying to approach it with logic and their feelings. But God, you're bigger than that. Help them to realize to pray in the mind of the Spirit because God, you are a mighty God and you have not changed and you are a miraculous God and that we rely upon you are sovereign, and you are not a respecter of persons. God, we acknowledge you in this place. Go with us tonight. God, go in our homes. Bless our homes. Let us draw closer together as we draw closer to you. We ask this in your own name, and we give you honor and glory in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. God bless you tonight. God bless you. You may be dismissed.